Hi, welcome to Station F, the world's biggest startup campus in the world. I'm Roxanne Varza and I'm here with Leila Jana, who is a pioneer in the social impact space, founder and CEO of social enterprises Sama Source and Luxme. Uh, Leila, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, I think what you're doing is so important for entrepreneurs around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about these two companies? where the ideas come from, where you're going with them. Well, merci, Roxanne. It's, it's <laughs> such a pleasure to be here. Um, I love Paris and what you're building is really revolutionary, I think, for Europe, which is quickly becoming a, a huge capital of, of technology as, as the costs of doing business in San Francisco are rising. <laughs> so, uh, so it's exciting. And um, I am trying to make every business around the world a social enterprise. I think it's really silly that in 2017 we still believe in this outdated model that we should work all day to make money and then at the end of the day donate some percentage of our profit to charity. That model is what has created the broken system that we're living in where over a billion people are still forced to live on less than one dollar a day. Uh, which means that they can't afford food and water and the very basics. And our traditional way of responding to that is through philanthropy. Let's build these poor people wells. Let's give them free education. Uh, let's build them schools and send them books. But they don't need our charity. What they need most is work, and they need a chance to participate fairly in global economic systems. I think we're at the dawn of a new phase of capitalism where social impact will become a primary lens through which consumers make purchasing decisions and through which businesses operate. If you just think about the billions of dollars that businesses spend every year on goods and services for their own employees, businesses that are buying you know, catering services for their lunch rooms or uh, employee t-shirts, um, each of those purchasing decisions can go towards vendors that promote uh, fair wages for low-income people and that give work and that adopt this philosophy of social impact. So I think in the future we're going to see a world in which social impact is an imperative for every business and not just something that is marginalized to charities and philanthropies. My God, I hope you're right. <laughs> I really hope you're right for the future of our planet. But tell me specifically about the problems that you chose to focus on and why did you pick, because there's so many things we can do. Why did sure. you pick these specific challenges? Sure, well, um, I had spent a lot of time trying to understand why poor people are poor. So why do we live in this world where a billion people cannot make enough to, to eat? And these are people who are working, by the way, full time. So there are a billion people who are working more than eight hours a day to earn less than one dollar. They cannot feed themselves or their families on that. So I started trying to understand what are ways that we can provide higher wage work to the poorest people. What is the fastest, most effective way to catapult them out of poverty? And I stumbled into the digital economy back in 2005. I read Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and he talked about how the internet was proliferating around the world and making it possible for the first time for someone from a slum in India or a rural part of Africa to sell their services online. And for the first time, you wouldn't need infrastructure to create a business in a poor area. Like, you don't need roads, you don't need good waterways or shipping, you know, or customs officials who aren't going to hold up your orders. You can do things digitally and cut through all of those middlemen. And so that idea was so powerful. The idea of basically creating a new marketplace, a digital marketplace for, for the brain power of the bottom of the pyramid. And that's how Samasource was born. Super. So Samasaur is specifically what you guys are doing. You're essentially taking big jobs and breaking them down into little pieces, is that correct? That's right. So Sama means equal in Sanskrit, and the idea is to uh, create more equity in the digital uh, economy by breaking down these very large jobs into small units of work. We call it micro work, and then teaching low-income people who don't have many skills how to do this work on computers. So for example, there's a huge need now for image tagging uh, for all of the new autonomous vehicle uh, algorithms. So anyone who's working on autonomous vehicles needs lots of what's called training data. We need to be able to train the computer to understand what's happening in an image by, say, drawing, um, you know, a, 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 circling an object in that image like a human foot or a stop sign and labeling it as such. And so the same way that humans learn through pattern recognition, machines learn through pattern recognition, and the creation of that training data is just one of the things that Samasource workers are now doing. 
Since we started in 2008, we have moved 35,000 people squarely out of poverty. And I'm really happy to report that this is not just a temporary intervention. This is not like we give them some money and then they are less poor this year, but next year they fall back into the poverty line. This is like they in increase their income by more than 400%. Wow. So we move <laughs> people impressive. on average from $2 a day to well over $8 a day, which in the world of poverty reduction, in the world of development economics, is extremely hard to do. And so it beats microfinance, it beats virtually any other intervention you can do. Of course, it's very hard because we have a very specific business model that requires you know, certain things like internet access and electricity. Um, but I think it's a very viable solution for millions of young, relatively educated people who are still living in extreme poverty. In places like Kenya and Uganda where we work in Africa, or India and Bangladesh and Pakistan in South Asia, you have many millions of young people finishing secondary school and now that they can read and write and use a cell phone and understand a digital menu, there's nothing for them to do. And so it's that demographic that Samosource is very effective um, in helping. And now we actually are the largest outsourcing company in East Africa. We have 1,200 full-time agents just doing these types of, uh, of micro work tasks. So things like tagging images, we do a lot of content work for websites like Glassdoor and Getty Images. And by the way, the other cool thing about the Samosource model is it doesn't just work in developing countries, it also works in poor parts of developed countries. So we've set it up in rural parts of the United States where we have a huge crisis of inequality. We have the worst inequality in the US since 1920, with the rich getting richer and the poor basically staying stagnant or getting lower. And so we have an intervention that also works in poor communities that are isolated because of their geography in places like the US and we would, we would love to try it more in Europe with migrant populations or with groups of people who've been unemployed for a long time because they no longer have the skills to be relevant in the digital economy. So cool. And so who's actually buying, quote unquote, these services? What, who's paying for it? So big companies, companies like Google and Microsoft are our clients and we work just like a normal data services vendor. So sometimes clients have told us they didn't even realize we had a social mission because they had just heard a reference from one of their you know, friends in the data science world that we were a very good vendor. That's and good. so these are typically product managers or data scientists within these large technology companies. But increasingly we're finding work in, in consumer internet as well, like not just behind uh, computer vision algorithms, but also doing things like curating content for big websites. We've built uh, e-commerce product catalogs for companies like Walmart. Um, and there's, you know, as content now rules the world, there's a huge need for curating, um, editing, and filtering that content, which, which Samosource can do pretty well. So cool that it's done by a nonprofit. I just think that so many people think you need to have a for-profit enterprise to do these kinds of things and to make this kind of difference. But I'm really interested to know um, how big is your team? What's actually, what do you actually need to run a business like this? Um, well, it took me a while to figure out what I actually needed and to get where we are now. So even though Samosource is technically a nonprofit, which means, it, all it means is in the United States, if we make a profit, we cannot take that profit out of the company. So it's basically like a non-dividend company, but we can be profitable. In fact, we are profitable. We're one of, I'd say, pretty few companies in Silicon Valley <laughs> that's now operating profitably. And so we reinvest all of that cash back into our core business and expand it. And so if we do really well, you know, I can't sell the business. Um, I can't uh, sell equity to investors. Maybe that'll change one day. But right now, um, we're structured as a nonprofit. And the reason we structured ourselves this way is we wanted to prove to the world that you could build a real business with a social mission being the first priority of everyone in the business. Our investors, who are basically donors, our staff, our workers, everyone is aligned that our mission is not to just grow a really profitable enterprise, our mission is to move as many people as possible out of poverty. So I think we might change that status if, um, if we find that there's a more effective way to help more people. Maybe one day in the future with the advent of B corporations and all of the new models for 
uh, setting up companies in the U.S., there might be a way that we can achieve our mission, put social impact first, and still, um, you know, and, and grow faster in a different structure. But for now, we're a nonprofit. So cool. How do you how do you yeah. fund a business like this? Where do you get the initial resources for it? So it was really hard um, when I started Samosource. I was told by many of the people I asked for funding that. Um, women in poor parts of Africa cannot do technology. It was literally told that by some, you know, crusty old people <laughs> um, and, you know, traditionalists that, oh, well, they need food and water before they can, they can build technology businesses. In fact, a very prominent angel investor in Silicon Valley told me that. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to prove you wrong. So it was very hard in the early days because the traditional venture capitalists didn't want to fund me because they saw the business as too risky and too impact oriented and not profit oriented enough. And then the flip side, the nonprofit people, the philanthropists thought that this was too risky because they thought there's no way that these poor people in Africa are going to be able to do this work. And so it took me a long time before I could convince anyone to fund us. And the first people who believed in me were individuals, were private Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who saw me give, I think I gave the most desperate pitch of my life <laughs> um, after I'd visited a refugee camp called Dadab, which made headlines recently because it's going to be closed down. And it's also, now there are four concurrent famines going on, the most that we've ever seen in the world. And um, several of them are in this region in East Africa that um, is near Somalia and Ethiopia and northern Kenya. So I was visiting Dadaab and I set up a program for Sama Source there and I saw how desperate the situation was and became extremely depressed and then came back to Silicon Valley and was in this mansion giving a presentation and I almost broke down in tears because it can be really hard to see that side and you know the wealthy Silicon Valley side and have to balance the two. So I, I almost broke down and at the end of that presentation, two people came up to me and they said, we believe in you. And each of them had given me a check for $25,000 before two weeks had passed. So I had $50,000 um, and I had uh, money from a business plan competition that I entered. So uh, the Dutch are incredibly progressive socially and they actually have a lottery system. It's a public lottery called the Dutch Postcode Lottery. It's the third largest philanthropy in the world. They give away 400 million euros a year. Wow. So all of this kind of helped you kickstart yes. the business. The, 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 the Dutch lottery ran a business plan competition. We got into it. We got 22,000 euros. So my first donors were just like random chance. And slowly but surely, we got more mainstream people interested once we showed them the results of these you know, poor women in Africa <laughs> and what they wow. could do, which was obviously uh, you know, the same thing that people here can do, they just needed the opportunity. That's incredible. I'm just wondering though, you've mentioned kind of these Silicon Valley mindsets and somewhat they're very cliche, but they exist. I'm wondering what does it feel like to be um, a social entrepreneur with a nonprofit business in a place where it really cash is king? It's so frustrating because when I first moved to Silicon Valley in 2008, it felt very different. I remember meeting the founder of Dropbox and the Airbnb founders and even the Facebook founding team. We all went to college together. And at that time, we were all just a bunch of nerds who had crazy big ideas, but no one had any real money. No one was like, cool. Like Silicon Valley was where you went if you were a nerd with a dream, but not really to make money. All the cool people were in investment banking in New York. So, you know, you wouldn't see models at parties. <laughs> no one, like, no one dressed in, you know, expensive clothing. And in many ways, it was my ideal world. I went to a math and science high school where everyone was a geek. And people loved, people loved technology and math and science for the sheer joy of producing interesting things. They didn't really care about money. No one was in it because they wanted to be a billionaire at that time. Uh, now it's changed a lot and it, it's challenging because I think as a social entrepreneur to see that much money spent on lavish parties and clothes and things that really seem like excesses while San Francisco, for example, is undergoing a huge homelessness crisis, while there are four concurrent famines, while there are so many problems in the world, it can be frustrating. But at the same time, I think um, it's all the more reason for me to keep doing my work because there is an unprecedented amount of capital and power in the valley now. And so if even a few percent, uh, you know, if even a few, a few key people, if, if just a small percentage of Silicon Valley 
changes their mindset and embraces social impact and invests in the sorts of things that we're doing at Sama and Luxme, we can see a huge change in the world. Yeah. So I, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic too, but let's talk about Luxme actually. Good <laughs> yeah. thing you brought it up because it's such a different business. What made you launch Luxme and how does it work even? Sure, so I'll show you a little product sample. <laughs> um, so Luxme is named after the Hindu goddess of beauty and prosperity. So Sama means equal in Sanskrit and Luxme it refers to this goddess. I love names uh, from the motherland from <laughs> India. And I decided to start Luxme because I saw a really interesting opportunity for social impact to take over luxury. There is presently no Chanel of social impact. That is a quote that we were just called in CNBC, <laughs> which I'm really excited That's about. Cool. <laughs> but, but no one is taking the social impact model squarely into the world of the luxury customer. And in this world, businesses regularly see gross margins of more than 70%. So very big margins in the industry. And where is that margin going? It's going to create the next heiress. It's going to create you know, more money for uh, Estee Lauder and L'Oreal. I mean, no offense to Estee Lauder and L'Oreal, but if you're an idealistic younger person who now wants to buy a luxury product because you're starting to make money at your job, um, why not spend the money on a product that's not only beautiful and good for you, but also good for the world? So I saw an opening for that, and I saw that one could build a business like this as a for-profit because the margin structure enables it. Whereas with Samasource, we're basically a much lower margin business, so it's hard to operate with the kind of, um, you know, the kind of cash flow that a luxury business operates with. And therefore, I set up Luxme as a for-profit, and I donated a third of my personal equity to Samasource. So the whole idea is to create a new awareness in the luxury world for social impact, and we started in beauty because I found that there were many interesting, wild, and rare botanical ingredients that not only have a social impact because of the way they're sourced as fair trade um, mm -hmm. ingredients, but also have an environmental impact because by creating a sustainable supply chain for a wild ingredient from, let's say, the Amazon, we can create an incentive for people locally to preserve that land instead of selling it to a mining company. Or what's happening now is all of this land is getting all the trees are getting cut down to make room for cattle so that we can have more beef, which the world really doesn't need. Mm -hmm. And so if you can instead show local people they can make more money by harvesting something that is precious and selling it at a premium price to discerning customers, all of a sudden you have a way to transform this seemingly in, you know, not valuable tree into something that's really worth something in the market. And so for those reasons, I thought beauty was a really interesting place to start. I thought no one's really doing rare, wild ingredients and highlighting these beautiful natural products that aren't just good for you and good for the world, but also really, um, you know, really deeply driving environmental impact. Super interesting because I think you've taken two businesses that are so different, but they treat in many ways the, a similar problem in a very similar way. It's kind of training people, educating them, helping them rise out of poverty, but you've structured the businesses differently. I'm wondering what, what changes did you make? What did you learn potentially from Salma or what challenges were very different between these two companies? It's funny because um, even though I raise venture capital for Luxme, which I would recommend, by the way, you should only do if you absolutely have to do it. I'm really thrilled that we have angels and, and really great VCs in our Luxme round, but I'm always a, a fan of like building as much as possible um, you know, as, a, as a lean startup and owning as much as possible of the business because I see a lot of social enterprises kind of go down the tubes when they get acquired by a company that does not uphold the same standards. So just a side note, and, and for me, even though I raised money for Luxme, I would say I still encountered many of the same challenges as I did with Sama. It's a bit of a myth that just raising money will solve your problems. You basically learn faster if you raise money because you run the experiments more quickly, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. So you have the money to run a Facebook ad campaign, an A-B test with a larger population. You have the money to hire someone to accelerate what you might have taken many more months to do on your own. So um, all that to say that uh, I think you know it's been, it's been in many ways just as challenging. It's a totally new industry. I knew nothing about beauty and skincare. Never in my wildest dreams did I expect that I would be running a skincare business. <laughs> but to me, just like Samasource, 
I'm not interested in Zomasource because it's a technology data services or outsourcing company. I'm interested in Zomasource because it solves a core human problem, which is poverty. And for the same reason, I'm interested in Luxme. I was just in, um, in Suriname, in the northern part of the Amazon, and I met with the head of Conservation International there. And he told me the single best thing we can do to preserve the Amazon, which is incredibly endangered right now. We've, we've discovered fewer than 1% of the plant species in the Amazon, and it's getting destroyed faster than we can discover new things. He said the number one way to save plants there is to do businesses like Luxme. He said if we can show local people that they can make more money sourcing rare skincare oils than by selling their land or even leasing their land, um, that's what they're going to do. And so I'm so convinced that this beauty and skincare business is a means to a deeper end of addressing poverty and addressing environmental concerns through sustainable supply chains. That's awesome. I think for entrepreneurs that are looking for an idea, <laughs> that's a really good one. I'm wondering though, like so many um, social impact businesses, nonprofits, I think they have a higher failure rate than your average startup, which has a super high failure rate. What would be your advice to people who want to get started in a social impact business, but they're petrified because they think it won't go anywhere? Yeah, well, I would say um, number one is your product has to work. So product is king. It doesn't change if you have a great social mission. So if you don't have a product that people actually want that solves a real customer problem, then no one's going to buy it no matter how good for the world it is. And sadly, I have seen so many great, in my mind, great social impact concepts or products that just don't go the final mile. Like maybe I think in the consumer space there are a lot of um, really great mission-oriented brands that look terrible. They have bad packaging. The packaging is green or brown or it looks like it was made for a hippie. Now, I am secretly a hippie. <laughs> I secretly shop at natural food stores for my, a lot of my beauty and personal care. But the average consumer does not. So we have to put ourselves in the mindset of the woman who's shopping at Monoprix or uh, at, at you know, Nordstrom's or at Target and what does she want. And we have to make social impact you know, first and foremost about the quality of the products. And if the product is good, then all other things being equal, why would the consumer not choose the social impact option? So I think we've seen this time and time again, and now I think um, social impact brands are starting to get it, that it's not about labeling your product eco anything. It's not about using brown paper to <laughs> do the packaging. It's not about looking like you're an eco warrior. It's about almost secretly um, embedding the social impact into a beautiful product that on its own would would do well. I love it. I think I think you're completely right and I hope more entrepreneurs gravitate towards you know kind of slipping in social things. I also think a lot of businesses unfortunately kind of exploit social messages for their own marketing or what have you so hopefully we'll gravitate in the other direction but I, now I want to ask you probably something more in line with where we are. Mm -hmm. um, when you actually started your businesses you were in Silicon Valley and now you're in Paris and your business has grown so much. Tell me what do you think about the place we're in, does this kind of thing, would it make sense for a new social impact startup? What are your thoughts? So um, I would move here in a heartbeat if we could <laughs> recruit here. So we're looking for engineers, uh, con people who can produce content for us, image content and written content in English. That's probably the biggest barrier to a lot of um, American entrepreneurs is just feeling like they might not be able to get um, all of their needs met in English. But I would say that's a myth because there are plenty of really strong French and European designers and uh, people who can write content and engineers who are perfectly capable of working in English. So um, I would say my impression is that there is a growing startup community in Europe and it's especially exciting because the costs are getting so high in Silicon Valley. You pay such a premium for building a company right now in Silicon Valley that it makes sense to do it anywhere else especially in a country like France where you have such strong technical education, really strong design education. Um, so it seems like there's a talent pool that is going to really massively um, benefit from Station F and what you guys are doing here. Awesome. And you probably haven't gotten a chance to see the whole campus yet, but what are your first impressions just from what you've seen, what you've heard? It's really stunning. I don't know much about the sustainability angle, so I'll be honest, <laughs> like that matters a lot to me. So I want to know if it's like LEED certified and there are sustainable materials, but um, I think it, it looks really iconic and I think it's a really exciting thing for France.
Super. Well, Layla, so, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. And hopefully we'll set up an office here and I'll see a lot we more hope of you. We you'll come here. <laughs>